Thank you very much, my friend Kumar. Uh, I'm always happy to talk to you and uh, to your uh, institute. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much you are acquainted with the uh, Israeli uh, political system, so I'll just a few word, say a few words, so I'll bring you in to what's happening. Uh, we have a unicameral parliamentary system. Uh, we have proportion, proportionate election system, which means that the whole country uh, is one constituency. Of course, this can be done in a country like Israel with only you know, less than 10 million people. Uh, in India, it would be more difficult. Uh, and you vote for a party list. You cannot change the, uh, the uh, priorities on the list. And this is your choice. The threshold is 3.25%. Uh, which amounts to about uh, four Knesset members. Um, this is not uh, too high. In Turkey, we have, for example, 10%. In Germany, it's 5%. Uh, and uh, uh, the parties actually uh, find a way to get around the 325% uh, uh, <clears throat> threshold by uniting and afterwards parting away after the elections. Uh, it's a very creative system, in, in, basically. Now, the, uh, such a system, of course, encourages fragmentation uh, of the political system. We have, uh, uh, as we'll see later, uh, certain parties being elected into this Knesset. Uh, it also uh, produces responsiveness in the system. Uh, basically, small groups uh, can uh, put in their candidates into the Knesset, uh, which means less alienation of the electorate of uh, the politician and the political system. And indeed, uh, we have in Israel a high uh, uh, voting turnout, uh, over 60%, sometimes 70%. Uh, which shows that a lot of uh, Israelis are involved and go uh, to the elections, which of course is a legitimizing uh, device for uh, the system. Uh, as a result of the fragmentation of the system, we have coalition politics. In order to get the magic number of 61, we have 120 uh, parliament members, you have to produce a coalition of parties. And uh, this encourages basically pragmatism and compromises. So uh, if you listen to me, I am not against the system. There are many people that in Israel, uh, particularly American political scientists who are used to a different system, uh, want to make changes. Uh, I'm a conservative. I, I am satisfied with what we have, and I think it's not uh, such a bad system. Uh, Having said that, uh, we have uh, in the last two years, four elections, campaigns, you know, in two years, in March 2019, September 2019, uh, March uh, 2020, and uh, March 21. You know, uh, when I read Julius Caesar many years ago, you know, beware the Ides of March. Well, March is not a very good month for us. And uh, uh, something is not working, obviously. You know, uh, doing it again and again and not producing a government seems that the system uh, or something in the system is, uh, is problematic. And I would like now to show the results. Kumar, can you show the results of the, of the Knesset uh, elections? Uh, so uh, those are the uh, elections system. The first largest party, Likud, led by Netanyahu, the prime minister, has 30 seats. Uh, this means that it is the largest party, by far the largest party in, uh, in the Knesset, with the largest following in Israel. Uh, the first uh, four 
parties, which I uh, you see on the slide, is uh, the pro Netanyahu uh, block. Shas, which is orthodox of uh, Sephardi origin, Jews from uh, from North Africa, from the Arab countries, uh, has nine seats. United Torah, which is a similar ultra orthodox party, uh, it has seven. It's Ashkenazi, Jews from European uh, extraction, and uh, religious Zionism uh, led by uh, Smotrich, uh, which is an amalgamation of different streams of uh, religious Zionism with the exception of the liberal part, uh, have six. This brings us to 52. I, you can check my arithmetics. It's 52 seats. Of course, this is short of the 61 number, 61 magic number. We have another party, which uh, Yamina, a right-wing party, uh, largely, uh, you know, uh, religious Zionist, but not only, with six seats. Bennett, its leader, uh, who has ambitions to be prime minister, has uh, uh, made, uh, he's the only one in the system that said he's not supporting either Netanyahu or supporting a coalition against Netanyahu, hoping to be uh, the, in the middle and uh, maybe becoming prime minister. Uh, the other parties, uh, you know, New Hope, is uh, starting with the New Hope, is the anti-Netanyahu bloc, basically all saying, we are not going to make election with this guy uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, they don't like his uh, guts. They don't like the fact that he is uh, uh, being indicted. And uh, they are, uh, you know, Saar just split from Likud a few months ago. He was one of the leaders in uh, Likud and uh, uh, he was dissatisfied with uh, Netanyahu. There is a personal feud between them. So he got six seats. He also wanted to be prime minister. You know, in the, in the land of the Jews, many want to be prime minister, seeing that they want to, smart enough to be prime minister. Israel Beteno is the Lieberman, uh, also former, once former Likud. He was uh, a friend of Lieberman, of uh, Netanyahu. Not too many stay his friends uh, along his career. And uh, uh, he has his own party, which is primarily uh, of Russian uh, immigrants, uh, seven seats. Yeshatid is the largest opposition party with Lapid, uh, its leader, has 17 seats. This is the second largest party in the Israeli uh, parliament. Uh, Blue and White, who in the previous election was united with Yeshatid and they both had the same name, blue and white, is led by former chief of staff Gantz, who was, uh, until uh, elections uh, were uh, announced, and it still is part of a Netanyahu interim government. And after uh, <laughs> enduring, you know, uh, the abuses of Netanyahu during uh, his uh, partnership in the government, he vows not to go back into a Netanyahu-led coalition. Uh, New Hope, Yamina, New Hope, Israel Beteno are all right-wing parties. Uh, blue, yes, Atid, and Blue and White are centrist parties. So uh, 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 afterwards we see labor, uh, revived labor, which it's not that it's part of the left now. It was once a centrist party, now it's more and more, it, it veered to the left over the years. Six uh, seats and Meretz, which is left, um, have, uh, has also six seats. Both Labour and Meretz both have on their list Arab uh, candidates who are elected to the Knesset. Uh, now the last uh, party on this, uh, in this group is uh, United Arab List, which is basically uh, a nationalist, uh, communist, you know, communist, not uh, real communist, it's salon communist uh, style, led by Ude, uh, an Arab, that uh, is uh, on the left. It's also an amalgamation of several parties. 
And if we take all those that are anti-Netanyahu, we get to the number of 58. Again, New Hope, Israel Betenu, Yesh Atid, Blue White, Labor, Merits, United List, all that are against Netanyahu and are not willing to be part of a Netanyahu coalition have 55 seats. Now this, uh, uh, which again is not enough to form a coalition. So, uh, so far, uh, Netanyahu cannot form a coalition, uh, and uh, also the opposition to him cannot form a coalition. And we have, a, a, it's not a new party, Ra'am. It was a party, an Arab party, Islamist party, a moderate Muslim Brotherhood version uh, that uh, split from the United List that it was previously part of it. And uh, it uh, decided not to be anti-Netanyahu. And uh, actually, uh, what is happening now, if we take a look at what's happening, if Netanyahu is successful in bringing in Yamina with six seats and Ram with four seats, he has 62 seats in the Knesset. Uh, of course, Ram is courted now also by the opposition, and uh, uh, this is part of the unfolding game in in the Israeli politics in order to reach the magic number of 61. Uh, to be more precise, Ram, the Islamist party, uh, which uh, shows some pragmatism, and it's not so ideological, is willing to support a Netanyahu government without being a member of the coalition. Support outside the coalition uh, because they don't want to take responsibility for certain decisions that an Israeli government might take, like uh, uh, military action in Gaza or military action elsewhere. They don't want to be part of it. And uh, they basically concentrate on the needs of uh, their constituency in Israel. They want better housing, better police uh, uh, enforcement. Uh, they want uh, uh, better education system for their constituency. It's you know typical uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, politics, domestic politics. Uh, and the big question is, why can't Netanyahu win the election? This is a false election. And, you know, uh, Netanyahu, after all, has an excellent record. Um, we have a thriving economy due to his policies, due to his vision, high tech and uh, going east to China, to India. He is definitely recognized by all as a world-class leader. Uh, he can make a call to Putin. He can make a call to Modi. Uh, he can make a call to Trump, who is Biden. The situation is a bit different. But he definitely is a, a world player. European leaders consult him. So he has definitely... Uh, a wonderful echo, uh, uh, international record. Also, uh, just a few months ago, he was succeeded in uh, producing the Abraham Accords, which added uh, four countries, Arab countries, uh, to the list of countries that Israel has uh, peace treaties and uh, diplomatic uh, representation. This is uh, very much appreciated in Israel. Many Israelis now uh, go to uh, Abu Dhabi for uh, to see what's happening there and you know enjoy the trip. So a new uh, Arab vistas were open to to the Israelis. Um, also, Netanyahu uh, made uh, President Trump recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital which is very important for Israelis. There is a great consensus about you know, Israel, uh, Jerusalem being the capital of, of Israel. So all those 
you know, wonderful deeds he has done for Israel are not successful. Finally, he is the hero of the COVID-19 crisis. He is the one that was uh, smart enough to uh, order millions of vaccinations half a year ago. And Israel is the first country to get out, at least that's what they say, I don't know what will be in the future, from the COVID crisis. Uh, so the oldest record, which probably would be enough in other country to get elected as prime minister, particularly since nobody is you know, close to him, it's not enough. Furthermore, if you ask Israelis who is the best suited to be prime minister for Israel, over 40% say it's Benjamin Netanyahu. Even people that don't vote for Likud recognize the fact that no other party can field a candidate that is as good as him for prime minister. So it's a serious question. And I'm not sure I, I have an answer. I have some feelings about it. Um, and I'll, before I'll go to my answer, I want to analyze shortly the, the campaign and how Netanyahu did in this campaign. Of course, one reason for him not winning the election is the fragmentation uh, in the right-wing bloc. Saar left the party, split the party. He got six seats. At least three of them are uh, at the expense of Likud. So uh, there was a challenge from the right. And those are Likud voters. Um, also, uh, there was a rather low voting turnout. This time, uh, just above 60%. The last time was 70. Now it's, uh, I'll tell you the exact number. It was 67.2, uh, which is relatively high in, in democratic countries, but it's below, less than it was last time. And it's quite clear that in the urban concentrations, that Likud has a lot of voters, those voters didn't turn, didn't go out to, to vote. It seems that Netanyahu lost about 300,000 votes. Now I'm not sure that all of them would have voted Likud, but we can evaluate that he lost another four, five Knesset seats because of the low turnout. Um, Netanyahu was successful in uh, getting at least one Knesset member by campaigning in the Arab sector. This time, uh, Netanyahu, and uh, he is called in the Arab sector Abu Yair, father of Yair, this is how they call him. Abu Yair spent a lot of time in the Arab sector uh, trying to uh, get votes there and also to uh, uh, break, to weaken the United Arab List. And actually with his uh, political acumen, he succeeded in convincing uh, uh, Ram uh, to stay on the fence. It was not only him, I think that uh, the Ram leader, uh, Abbas, uh, was uh, smart enough to understand that if he wants uh, to uh, uh, get part of the pork barrel, as we say in America, he has to play the game. And uh, uh, so both had an interest and, uh, and Abu Yair did well in the Arab sector once he was hated, you know, for being a right winger. No, he, Abu Yair was popular. And uh, so he did well in the Arab sector. He is also encouraged uh, voting for the new, uh, you know, religious Zionist 
uh, list who was in danger of not crossing the threshold. And he told people, don't vote for me, vote for religious Zionists because they are in his pocket in the coalition. He succeeded too well, actually, but <laughs> they got seven. So uh, um, <clears throat> he also succeeded in uh, attacking both Bennett and Saar, who got six, uh, six, seven seats in the Knesset, belittling their chances with this number of seats to really become contesters for the prime minister position. Uh, the main reason, however, and I have no proof for it, for uh, Netanyahu not winning those elections, in particular the last one, is because he is a polarizing figure. He, in contrast to other politicians, has a very antagonizing style. And uh, for some reason, which I do not always understand, uh, many people in the electorate hate him, hate his guts, uh, hate his family. Well, uh, he may have deserved somewhat of this uh, type of attitude, you know, with uh, a very, uh, you know, <laughs> eccentric son, Yair, you know, very, comes out very right wing, you know, and his wife, who uh, is uh, a grand madame and uh, behaves, uh, you know, in re regal manners. You know, this, uh, these things don't go well with the Israeli electorate. And uh, uh, he's not liked. He's not liked by, by too many. They recognize, as I mentioned, his qualities. They recognize his intellect. They recognize that he is also a good campaigner, a good politician. In many non-liquid quarters, they call him the magician because he learned the job of a politician. I remember his first time as, as prime minister in 1996, he was a very bad prime minister. But to his credit, he learned the job and he became the longest serving prime minister in Israel. But, you know, success, you know, breeds also contempt. And, you know, we shouldn't forget Churchill lost election after World War II. Uh, so, fortunately, we didn't have a big war. Uh, but uh, it seems that Netanyahu has lost some of his touch. And... Um, He's not, he's not winning the elections. And too many of his own people that share his views uh, are not with him. So uh, this is probably the main reason. Another, I think, secondary reason is how he behaved during uh, the last government he headed. It was a national unity government in which he brought in uh, General Gantz, former chief of staff. And uh, I think I uh, describe something that most Israelis would agree. He abused Gantz. Gantz, a political novice, became a joke. And uh, he uh, <laughs> almost didn't cross the threshold. I have a good friend, uh, some of you know him, I don't want to say his name. Uh, he voted for him. He said to me, you know, an honest guy deserves, you know, a vote. He was too honest for Israeli politics. He was too honest. And he, you know, the ma machinations of, of, of uh, uh, Netanyahu simply ended the government. And uh, I think many people blame Netanyahu for the fall of this government. And don't forget Israelis like national unity governments. We had many national unity governments because uh, national unity governments uh, signals uh, social cohesion, 
uh, unity, those qualities are appreciated by Israelis. So um, I think that uh, he is being blamed primarily for uh, putting down the government uh, for his own personal needs, rather than uh, thinking about the good of the country. Of the good of the country. I want to make some general comments now. Ah, no, first of all, what's next? Of course, everybody will court Trump. Um, and uh, this puts Abbas, not Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinians, uh, our Abbas, uh, in a very good position. He says to openly, you know, he is not even ashamed of it. Whoever gives me more, I'll be with him, which is, of course, a very reasonable politician on part of uh, uh, a member of the community that wants to take care of his community. Nobody says anything against it. Everybody understands that this is a legitimate gain to get more out of the government, more resources. This is what politics is all about. If you remember Eastern, this is, you know, what's politics? Authoritative allocation of resources. So he wants to get resources. Um, we see that uh, the religious Zionist party that because of ideological reasons was against a coalition with, uh, with Ram, with the Arabs. Those are the Arabs. Uh, they were against it. They want a Zionist right-wing government. Uh, they were against. And, uh, but we hear new voices. Uh, some of them were first time elected to the Knesset. They don't want, uh, you know, new elections in a few months. You know, they want to warm this chair a little bit and to enjoy the perks of being a Knesset member. So uh, they become more pragmatic. I don't know what will happen, but uh, eventually, the position of Ram is supporting the government from outside and not being responsible for all government actions is something that could solve the impasse. Uh, of course, for that, we need also Yamina, Bennett. And uh, uh, Bennett, of course, uh, has a difficult decision First of all, to give up his own personal ambition for being prime minister. And second, to uh, deny Netanyahu a government that might be costly for him in the next election if there will be one. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu looks for defectors. He looks for defectors in the New Hope Party, which are all, most of them are former Likud members. And... Uh, of course, uh, if he becomes prime minister, uh, he can give a lot of goodies and he can compensate, at least for a while, those uh, defectors. By the way, he had it in mind already uh, before these elections, giving a seat on his Knesset list uh, to a person that defected in the previous elections to his party. So he wants to impress potential defectors that he's going to pay. Don't worry, I'm paying. You know, everybody thinks I'm a liar, but I'm paying. I'm, I'm promised and I'm paid. Uh, so uh, we'll see who, who is going to be more successful in getting defectors. I think Netanyahu probably has a better chance uh, to get defectors uh, because uh, many in the opposition parties, the, to the opposition bloc, are closer to him ideologically. Um, we, there are also defectors uh, within the Netanyahu bloc, particularly the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox have always been ready to be paid the highest price. And there is, for over the years, there was a historical uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> partnership with Likud, uh, but now they are a bit mad at Netanyahu that uh, uh, turned some of their voters toward religious Zionists. And uh, particularly the Ashkenazi party, Ashkenazi Orthodox, Ultra-Orthodox party, United Torah, uh, Judaism, uh, 
already refused to commit itself to Netanyahu. Uh, what will the other party do? It's not clear. But if both parties defect, actually the opposition bloc doesn't need the Arab United List uh, for, uh, for building an alternative coalition. Um, now, of course, the first that will be chosen by the president to be candidate for prime minister has an advantage. He, has, he can promise first and there's a better chance to deliver. Uh, today, the president received formally the uh, re election results, but there is always a but in Israeli politics. There is bad blood between him and Netanyahu for years, for a variety of historic reasons. So will he hand in uh, the candidacy to Netanyahu? He has full freedom to do whatever he wants. Uh, according to the law, constitutional law. And uh, it basically, the law requires him to decide who has a better chance to establish a stable government in the near future. This is, of course, a very large mandate. He can do whatever he wants. Um, he's at the end of his career, political career. He, he, uh, he's, he's already in July, will be ex-president. It's not clear what he's going to do. Uh, I would risk to say that he will probably really think, uh, you know, uh, uh, in substantive ways and see who has a better chance. And his personal vendetta will, with Netanyahu uh, will be a secondary factor. Now the game continues until uh, April 6th. On April 6th, what's happening on April 6th? The Knesset convenes, the new Knesset, the new parliament convenes. And the first thing every parliament has to do is uh, to elect a chairman. And uh, we don't know who is going to be the chairman. And then we'll see part of the game unfolding. Will it be a chairman from the Likud block uh, or the opposition block, opposition to Netanyahu block? It's not clear. That's not only <laughs> afterwards in an additional complication. The opposition to Netanyahu wants to pass a law, a new law, that will prevent any prime minister, any candidate for prime minister, uh, to be acceptable if he has been indicted. The only prime minister that has been indicted, the only candidate that has been indicted for prime minister is, of course, Netanyahu. This is a, clearly a personal law, which is problematic in a democratic system. Uh, will they be able to pass it? Again, it's not clear. It depends. Yamina, Ram, the, the dealing until uh, it's, you know, six more days. You know, the world was created in seven days. So, you know, if you want to, uh, what six days? Six days is a lot of time to do, to do a lot of dealings. Um, so I'll now end with some general comments. The uh, election was about uh, Netanyahu. Whether he's fit uh, to be prime minister for Israel. This was the only real issue. Nobody debated the policies vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Nobody debated the policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Uh, nobody debated uh, what, what to do about, you know, a, a new administration in Washington. There was no debate over economic policy. There was no debate about uh, how to solve the uh, corona crisis. What we see, basically, is tremendous consensus in Israeli society. Everybody agrees on most of the things. They don't agree who's going to be the prime minister. And Netanyahu insists on being the prime minister. And he's not successful in, in winning uh, you know, the confidence of the Israelis. So this is clearly one, something that you can learn from this election. Israel is, despite all the stories, despite all you know, the journalists that uh, you know, think about the divided so society, people speak in terms of tribes in Israel. 
Israel, particularly the Jewish sector, is very united. There is great consensus. A second observation is that we see the strengthening of the Israeli uh, right wing. Netanyahu has 50-52 within his bloc. If we had Yamina, six seats. A New Hope, Saar, led by Saar, another six seats. We have 12 plus 52 is 70. 70 Knesset members are right wing of right wing convictions. Their agenda is clear. Iran is a existential threat. The Palestinians are not ready for peace. Let's do conflict management. We have to reform the judicial system because it's, we have a too active Supreme Court of Justice. And the rest is fine. So despite the fact that Netanyahu is not able to build a, a, a stable co coalition, at least at this stage, and it's already the first time that he's not able, the right wing uh, policies and sentiment is prevalent in the Israeli electorate. We have another observer, we have, that's a new phenomenon. Many candidates for PM. Netanyahu, Lapid, Tsar, Bennett. Um, and in addition to what I said, that basically the elections were about Netanyahu, maybe you have a new trend of you know, personalization of Israeli politics. Basically paying too much attention, in my view at least, to the persona rather than to the issues. This is something new. Uh, another observation, Likud still remains the largest party. Its offshoots created additional prime minister candidates. Uh, and uh, they are not going to be prime ministers in my view. There is the only arena from which prime minister can come is Likud. Um, will uh, Likud rebel against Netanyahu? Um, there is a long tradition of uh, Likud suffering electoral defeats and not changing the leadership. Uh, is this part of a party DNA? So far, it seems true. Uh, but, uh, you know, politicians are ambitious. Uh, will, uh, will somebody very ambitious say enough with Netanyahu? Yeah, some very ambitious were, were sent away by Netanyahu. Everybody that became too ambitious, in his view or in his wife's view, was sent away. Um, I don't know what will happen in Likud. Uh, uh, my uh, feeling is that Netanyahu uh, sees it almost as a personal fifth dog. So Likud is me, l'état c'est moi, <laughs> the government is mine, uh, where should I go? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll run for another election as long as I can. So far as there is another election, I'm still prime minister. Um, Another question, interesting question, will uh, we see mergers with Likud? Uh, understanding that the real leadership will come from Likud has always brought back Likud defectors back to the party. This is true of Saar. This is true of Kahlon and other you know, politicians that left the government uh, this time. Or uh, uh, another person, Hanegbi or Zev Elkin. So there is a, a list of Likud politicians that have left Likud, went to other parties and eventually came back and they were received. The Likud has a long tradition of absorbing other parties, rejuvenating itself and extending its um, clout over the Israeli electorate. 
Um, finally, I want to say a few words about the Ra'am phenomenon. What we see is something uh, monumental. Basically, uh, part of the Arab electorate decided seriously it wants to be part of the system. And they say it openly. We want to be part of the system. Interestingly, it comes from an Islamist faction. And not a secular one. Uh, by the way, Islamists in Jerusalem, for example, have a tradition of, uh, of pragmatism. For, for a variety of reasons, also ideological. I don't want to go to that. But Ram, for the first time, with four Knesset members, say to the Jews, until now, we excluded ourselves from uh, the political system, from the political game. We want to be part of it. Are you serious about it? Give us a chance. And uh, Netanyahu's answer is yes. Uh, he doesn't say it you know, openly always, but he alludes to it, and he, of course, deals with Ram, uh, not by himself, but by uh, uh, <coughs> people around him. And this could change seriously, you know, the status of a minority in, in the Jewish state that has been uh, not fully part of the Israeli society. Of course, many of them are fully integrated in the Israeli economy, in, uh, in the parliament, even in the judicial system. Of course, there is no, uh, no formal uh, <coughs> Uh, discrimination against uh, Arab. So uh, this could change, uh, you know, the political game and could, <laughs> you know, until now the ultra-Orthodox were the, in the middle playing every time whoever was uh, closer to power. Now we see uh, an Arab, uh, you know, party uh, doing the same. Um, I don't know what will happen if they will become part of, uh, you know, some way part of the government. But uh, in my view, at least, first of all, this is a good sign of maturity among the Arabs, ready to play the game. And hopefully uh, the, the Jews will respond uh, positively. Uh, they have all responded. Will it be formalized? I don't know. So. This is an important moment in, in Israel's political history uh, in which uh, uh, part of the Arab minority in Israel uh, decided uh, to, uh, to be part of the political game. Uh, they don't join the military yet, they, and we don't ask them to join the military, but, but it's a sign of integration which, uh, of course, uh, diminishes uh, you know, the tensions that are, of course, existent in the uh, Israeli society. So uh, we have no uh, real uh, coalition yet. There are some positive signs, and uh, we may well have a big selection. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. So I'll end with that. Mm -hmm.